Now, let me introduce the speaker of the day. Uh, welcome, Dr. Alexander Bosford. He is a senior aquaculture technician in Darwin Aquaculture Center, Australia. Alex and I, we both share the same work site, but uh, working for two different uh, entities. Um, Alex did his honors at the Center of Marine Bioinvasion in the University of New South Wales, Australia. Later, he moved to Indonesia, working as an aquarium fisheries advisor for Takala Drakish Water Aquaculture Center, Mass Incorporated. Very recently, Alex completed his PhD from the National Marine Science Center of Southern Cross University, Australia. So today, Alex is going to share some of his important work from PhD, uh, which is interesting for those who are in the aquaculture industry. Alex is going to discuss what else you can feed marine larvae uh, other than the conventionally used species of Artemia, rotifers, and microalgae. So welcome again, Dr. Alex, and the stage is yours. Thanks for that, Deepak. Uh, okay, so the shares. Oh, it says uh, share screen. It's good to go now. Good to go. All right, cool. Do that one. Share. Okay. Look good. Look. There we go. Yeah. All good? Yeah, but not full yeah. screen. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. All right. Um, so, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to. Oh, I'm very happy to talk about my PhD, which I've now finished. Which, if anyone that's doing a PhD, it's always good when, it, when you knock it over. Um, the title is Alternative Live Feeds and Live Feed Enhancements for Marine Larva Culture. And as Deepak said, that was done at the National Marine Science Centre with Southern Cross University. Um, started that uh, in 2016. But um, before I did my PhD, I used to work here. So this is in Indonesia. This is a place called Bardi Island. I'll put my uh, pointer options as well as Deepak suggested. There we go. Um, so a lot of my work in Indonesia, that's kind of where I started doing aquaculture. Um, and, uh, you know, we, while working over there, we saw that uh, a lot of the people there were fishermen. Um, and, you know, they earned a living, you know, just going out, throwing a line in the, over the reef. And uh, my job was to turn a lot of these fishermen into uh, farmers by developing ornamental fish aquaculture procedures. Um, and that's because aquaculture posed as a more sustainable uh, and profitable livelihood for them. So you can see uh, over here, here are some of the small scale little aquaculture um, units. So they would grow uh, seahorses, uh, clownfish. Some of them even got into doing groper. Uh, and, you know, my PhD was a continuation of the work I did here uh, developing um, ornamental fish aquaculture or just aquaculture to help improve the uh, the industry and help people in developing nations like um, Indonesia. Uh, I click. Sorry, I'm operating two screens at once. Sorry if I'm going back and forth. Uh, so I'll, this talk will be broken into two parts. Uh, first part kind of talks about alternative live feeds themselves. Uh, basically, are there other invertebrates or invertebrate larvae that are suitable for fish larvae that can't consume traditional live feeds. And then we'll talk about uh, different live feed enhancements. So mainly looking at uh, can uncommon but nutritious microalgae be used as uh, a way to enrich live feeds or as a green water when you're uh, growing larvae. And I'll get into what that means a little bit later. So part one, can oyster larvae be used as so part one, can oyster larvae be used as an alternative live feed for small mouthed ornamental fish larvae? Uh, if you want to look into what I'm talking about in any more detail, that uh, well, all this is published uh, with the reference below, so you can go check that out. Uh, so let's start with a problem. Uh, so the problem is uh, wild collection. We talk about ornamental um, or the aquarium trade. Uh, a lot of it's done by wild collection and that's usually really damaging to coral reefs. Um, typically people use things like uh, cyanide, uh, sometimes dynamite, and uh, obviously that's not great, not great for the ocean. So people are looking to aquaculture as a way to meet that demand. Uh, there are about, there are over 1500 marine species in the aquarium trade, but only 30 of those come from aquaculture 
And a big part of that is really popular species such as butterfly fish, uh, angelfish and tangs or surgeon fish have larvae that are too small to consume rotifers, which are the most common first feed for larvae. So this is a rotifer here. This is actually a two scale picture of a rotifer next to a first feeding blue tang larvae. And you can kind of see the size. It's like almost the size of its head. So there's no way that it's going to be able to actually physically eat it. And you can see the stomach here. There's no way that's going to fit into, into that. So uh, we need something else. There needs to be another option uh, in order to uh, get these larvae to grow. Um, copepods are probably the most uh, or are the first, first alternative live feed people think of, uh, but they're really hard to grow um, and that causes crashes. And when you're talking about aquaculture, you don't like animals, growing animals that are hard to grow or prone to crashing. Um, so after looking through the literature, I found that uh, oyster larvae were a good candidate. They had uh, a very small size, about 50 micron. And, you know, they're easy to produce. You know, one female oyster can produce millions and millions and millions of um, eggs and larvae. And uh, so this first part of my thesis was about testing the effectiveness of uh, oyster larvae as a first feed for uh, blue tanks, so dory. Um, and we used blue tanks as a model species. Uh, just get give you guys a video to look at. Options. So at the National Marine Science Center, we have a uh, like we have some broodstock, and we were lucky that we were we got them to spawn within you know the first few months of us getting them. Um, you know this is all done naturally through temperature and photo period manipulation, and uh, you know during summer and autumn months you can see them spawning. Just there, you can't really see the spawn, but because the eggs are tiny, but that's them spawning. Um, during summer and autumn months, they spawn almost every night. Uh, tangs are notoriously difficult to grow. There's really only one place that does them, does them kind of in Florida, uh, but they haven't reached commercial success yet. Um, so it's a species that people are really, really keen to grow. Uh, so the first question was whether tangs can even eat oyster larvae. Uh, so this involved feeding blue tangs four different diets. Uh, one of, I'll turn my... Slicker pointer back. There we go. Uh, one of oysters, one oysters and rotifers mixed together, one of rotifers and also an unfed control. Uh, on the y axis, you can see what I measured uh, or how I measured this. So, first is prey incidence. So, that's basically if I saw, saw anything inside of the gut and also the gut area. So, how big the gut was. Uh, as you can see, when you gave the tangs oyster larvae, almost 100% of them had uh, prey in their gut along with corresponding uh, larger gut areas. So obviously guts are bigger because there's food inside of it. Uh, but when you give them rotifers, there's basically nothing because they can't eat them, it's too big. Uh, we also measured the survival in this first trial uh, across the four diets to five days. Uh, and there was no statistical difference between fish fed oysters and those that were left unfed. Uh, this was because the oysters were turning into shelled villages, basically like a little swimming clam. And you can see you've got a little picture here of one of their guts and you can actually make out the individual shells of the villages. And they basically can't digest that. It's uh, the stomach acid of the or stomach enzymes of the of first feeding blue tanks is not strong enough to break down a uh, carbonate shell. Um, so we needed to figure out uh, how to deal with that to make them digestible. So next step was to restrict the diet to just trochophores, the step before Veliger. Uh we fed the fish uh, trochophores, a mixture of trochophores and villagers, and also unfed. We basically just constantly flush out the oysters before they could turn into villagers so that the fish were only exposed to trochophores um, in the trochophore treatment. Uh, by doing this, there was, an, uh, you know, we saw some improvement in survival and also eye growth, but the survival was still really low. And that might be because uh, even though the trochophores are less calcified than the villagers, 
they still have a calcite, a, a, um, a carbonate shell and it's about 8% aragonite. It's very, very small. You can't see it by the naked eye, but it is there. It's kind of like a matrix that uh, forms around the oyster itself. So we need to deal with that problem. So the solution was to compromise the oyster's calcification. So we learned that the uh, presence of a calcium carbonate shell makes the oysters indigestible. So we uh, basically conditioned the oysters in an acidic, uh, in acidic water, like a little bath. Uh, basically, we got some water, dropped it down to a pH of 4.8, uh, which was as basically as far as the oysters could handle uh, it would, um, without killing them. And after only a few hours, we saw severe deformity. So you can see here, here's a regular oyster. Here's after two hours in, a, uh, in the pH 4.8 seawater, and here's after 12 hours. And so you can see the, uh, the acidic water really basically in, gets rid of all the, ca the calcium carbonate, and uh, it makes them very digestible. So if you can look over here, uh, there's a picture of you know, undigested, and these trochoids were actually alive in, uh, inside of a, uh, one of the fish. They said these were un. Uh, untreated trochophores, uh, but when we acidified the trochophores, they were able to digest them. That's evidenced by basically this big homogenous mass inside of the stomach, which is what you want to see, then the big blob of food that the fish are digesting. And the result of this was that, uh, you know, we got a lot more survival, a lot more fish went through. So the fish fed um, acidified oysters, this one, acid trochophore, uh, had the high had a high survival, especially like forty percent compared to you know the in the single digits we were getting before. Um, as a point of reference, yellow tangs, a close relative to blue tangs, uh, fed copepods tend to have about half of this survival at five days. This time point, um, tangs fed this treatment. Uh, the acidified trochophores were also the only treatment able to survive to ten days post hatch even though the survival was very low, uh, but that's the, si that's the stage where they're able to transfer onto rotifers, um, which is obviously a, a more common and easier to grow aquaculture live feed. Um, survival was still to 10 days was still low. This may have been due to uh, nutrition, um, but can't say that quite yet. So um, there's still a lot of work to do, but uh, it's at least a, a promising start. Um, Move that down. So um, clearly, uh, oyster larvae have promise as a live feed. Um, it's also uh, an important an important point is that other species of oysters that could be used around the world might have different nutritional profiles to the Sydney rock oysters that we were using. Um, you could also use maternal provisioning as a way of manipulating the uh, nutritional profiles of the oyster larvae to maybe make their nutritional profile a bit more suitable for tangs uh, to hopefully bump up their survival. Um, still a lot of work to do. It's pretty, it's a lot of work to grow tangs that way. But uh, the main point of this uh, section was to show that, you know, you want to look outside of the box when, uh, we'll think outside of the box when picking live feeds. Um, another uh, future direction would be to go do plankton surveys. That's what the guys at the National Marine Science Center are doing now. They're doing plankton trawls and trying to find uh, some plankton in the wild that is easy to grow, but also very small because you know there's who knows how many different species of plankton in the world. But for in aquaculture, we tend to just use one rotifers, maybe artemia as a secondary feed or copepods, but they're too hard to grow. So there's a lot of diversity in there that's, um, that uh, hasn't really been properly explored yet. Okay. So part two. So that's part one. Uh, part two of uh, my thesis basically took that thread of, you know, let's think outside the box. Let's look at um, uncommon live feeds. Let's look at, you know, things that people aren't using and see if they can replace the traditional standard. So we have a... Uh, we looked at whether uncommon but nutritious microalgae can be used as a live feed enhancement in green water media for um, rearing marine larvae. Uh, similar to the first section, if you want to read more about what I'm about to talk about, uh, both of uh, those chapters were published um, here. So microalgae as enrichments are commercial products the best option. So uh, 
we thought that nutritious microalgae might be maybe a better enrichment and also cheaper than commercial products. Um, this is especially true. Oh, sorry. Uh, previous studies have also have looked at this. So people have looked at haptophytes such as pavlova and um, isochrysis. Uh, but, you know, similar to the plankton, what else is out there? You know, the people that use pavlova in, I can't remember, I think it was Norway or something, they were doing it with cod. Uh, they didn't really have that much success, but there are so many different types of algae in the world. Why not try them? You know, see, see how they go. Um, the cost of commercial enrichments can be really expensive, uh, over 300 Australian dollars a litre. And if you're a little farmer on an island in the middle of Indonesia, uh, spending dropping three hundred dollars on a bottle of enrichment is you know, that's more than you'd make in a month. So that's not really an option for them. But because labor is so cheap, um, giving them algae that they can grow with simple fertilizers may be a uh, a good option for them. Um, so the we, algae we were looking at were cryptomonad microalgae. So they're underrepresented in aquaculture, but they're very nutritious. And what I focused on was a, an alga called uh, Proteomonas sulcata. It's an Australian cryptomonad closely, closely related to Rhodomonas, which is more, uh, I think, more well-known around the world. Um, it's the bright red one here. <laughs> uh, and um, I guess aside from the color, the other big difference is that it has a very large cell size compared to common algae such as nanochloropsis, which is the green algae you see here, or um, isochrysis or tisochrysis, which is another very common um, microalgae in aquaculture, brown one here. Um, they're also very motile. So they swim, they're kind of almost like a ciliate, if anyone's seen a, sw a ciliate swim in the water, um, which uh, helps them stay uh, suspended in larval cultures and enrichment cultures, which keeps your tanks cleaner. So if you're growing um, animals that are susceptible to, you know, dirty tanks or bacteria outbreaks, um, we found not in my PhD, but when we were growing uh, sea urchin larvae, um, we basically built the whole thing around uh, using proteomonas. And one of the big benefits was that the tanks were a lot cleaner compared to your more traditional microalgae blends that use ice crisis, um, pavlova, and catosphorus species. So the first, so the first experiment was testing uh, proteomonas enhanced live feeds on larval clownfish. So clownfish are a very popular, um, very popular type of ornamental fish. They're pretty much clownfish in every aquarium shop in the world. And for uh, people living in those rem uh, remote developing nations in small communities, uh, having an easy, an easy fish to grow such as clownfish was uh, a really good option for them because it's something that they could make money off. Um, there was always demand for it. Uh, but going back to what I was saying earlier, are commercial enrichments the best option for them? Maybe not. So we decided to, or I decided to feed uh, juvenile or larval um, Clownfish, the species is Amphiprion latezonatus. Um, four different diets. Uh, to give you a quick rundown, this PSE, Proteomonas, Proteomonas sulcata cultured. They started with rotifers that were actually grown on the um, Proteomonas for you know, several generations. Second diet, and second diet was uh, rotifers uh, enriched with Proteomonas for 12 hours. And then those two diets would subsequently get Artemia that were enriched with Proteomonas. Um, SSE is basically your hatchery standard. You're enriching your rotifers and artemia with a commercial uh, lipid emulsion called Selco Espresso. It's basically just emulsif um, a fish oil emulsif emulsion. And then as a control, we had unenriched. So we didn't enrich our live feeds at all. Um, they're basically just rotifers that were coming straight out of the culture tanks and artemia that were just hatched and fed. Um, and the first uh, result, which is pretty clear as day, is the survival. So the survival was uh, best when the fish were fed diets enhanced with proteomonas. So you can see here the proteomonas, whether they were fed the uh, proteomonas cultured or proteomonas enriched diet, especially up to seven days, when, which is the rotifer period, feeding period. Um, the survival was much better when they were fed those proteomonas enhanced live feeds. Um, as it went on into the artemia phase, uh, the fish that were initially fed those rotifers that were 
grown on the Proteomos for several generations. They uh, ended up being the best surviving overall. Um, meanwhile, the uh, Selco treatment kind of dropped off and the unenriched treatment, basically they all died by the end of the experiment. I think there was, actually, no, I think they all died. It's going back a few years, but I'm pretty sure every single fish died. Um, maybe there was one left. So similar to the survival, um, fish fed proteomonas had, uh, were much larger at seven days. And there was no difference at 14 days, the end of the experiment, but that was because all the small little weak fish in the, um, Selco treatments, the Selco enriched stream, they basically all died. All that was left with a bigger fish that managed to pull through. Um, and like I said before, the ones that were fed unenriched live feeds were all dead. Um, the main reason for those fish dying off in the unenriched stream was the lack of DHA, which is a very important fatty acid in um, marine aquaculture. Uh, rotifers coming out of a rotifer culture that's grown on nano, like a commercial nano paste um, and unenriched artemia don't have any DHA in them. Uh, and without that, there's, you get big problems with like brain development, neural development. Uh, they get all sorts of problems and um, they all ended up dying. But the benefits of uh, proteomonas aren't really tied to DHA. It's I, we suspect it was tied to their high phospholipid or polar lipid content. So if you look down here and you look at the levels of polar lipids um, in the uh, proteomonas cicada itself, you know, it's uh, over 90% of the lipids available to it are polar lipids and pol uh, phospholipids are structural lipids. Um, they're used for creating, you know, membranes and actually building tissue, uh, which when you're a, you know, larvae, you're not really interested in the neutral lipids, which are used for energy and fat storage. Um, you want to build muscle, you want to build, uh, build your body up and grow. So having uh, a diet that's very, very high in phospholipids and these um, structural lipids makes uh, it, it makes it very efficient. You know, they don't have to, the larvae are bad at turning neutral lipids and these energy lipids into structural lipids. It's better if you just give them the structural lipids and they just go, they don't need to convert anything. They just whack it onto their body and start growing. And uh, this trend of high um, polar lipids in the proteomonas um, enhanced treatment is carried over to the rotifers. So if you look at the rotifers here in green, the ones that were grown or enriched on proteomonas had much, much higher um, phospholipid content than those enriched with Selco. And especially the ones that were grown in the proteomonas over several generations, they had the highest um, phospholipid content uh, overall. Uh, we also uh, did a formal um, correlation using general linear based model. I'm not going to go into the stats of it, but um, we correlated uh, our fatty acid and uh, lipid class data with our survival and growth. And we found that um, surprisingly, uh, omega-6 docosapentaenoic acid, which is a fatty acid that very few people I think have heard of, uh, was correlated with positively with uh, survival and growth. Um, this is a very, honestly, I, I'd never heard, really paid much attention to that fatty acid before a guy named Giovanni Tercini, who's a co-author on it, um, saw it out, like picked it out in the data and he said, oh, check that out. Like that's a really important fatty acid that no one's paying attention to. And there's um, uh, evidence coming out of uh, Europe that this fatty acid might be actually like a key player in um, larval growth. It doesn't need to be there in huge amounts, but um, there was a very strong correlation um, between, you know, the level of uh, docosapentaenoic acid over D uh, DHA, docosahexaenoic acid. Um, so you can see the fish that had uh, higher levels of those of DPA and six, um, which were the proteomonas enhanced fish. Um, you know, they grew better and they also had more of the DPA and six, um, higher DHA. So in the, uh, or sorry, fish that were fed the commercial enrichment were much higher in DHA, which is what you'd expect. Um, especially here, DHA over EPA. That's probably one of the biggest, um, fatty acid ratios people look at. Uh, it was very, very high, but there was absolutely no correlation with survival or growth. So basically it didn't matter, um, that might be because clownfish don't necessarily have very high DHA requirements. They only need a little bit. 
they need some because the unenriched ones died. Uh, but as long as they're getting a little bit, other fatty acids such as DPA and six uh, may become a, uh, a larger player and um, might be more uh, responsible for driving that survival and growth. Okay, so next part, moving on was, so we've gone, okay, proteomonas, it's a great live feed enhancement, um, but what about a, we, how about we use it as a green water? So green water is basically just your culture water that you read your larvae in um, with, and it's got some microalgae in it. So it's called green water because typically people use um, poor quality microalgae, usually nanochloropsis or chlorella, and it makes the water green. Uh, you know, I can't think of any marine larvae that is um, predatory like fish or crabs or anything like that, prawns. I can't think of any that don't use green water. It's such a standard practice in pretty much every single hatchery that I know of at least. Um, and, you know, the main reason people use, there are a few reasons people use it, but for, um, you know, fish and crabs, I think the biggest thing is that it keeps the your live feeds um, full if they have something to eat and that stops them from starving because if your live feeds starve they start to use up the new, the resources they have within them and become a very poor quality food so we wanted to test um, proteomonas as a green water because we knew that the live feeds that we put inside of the tank in the uh, larval cultures would basically enrich themselves with it so we went or oh, do you even need to enrich your live feeds at all can you just throw unenriched live feeds into a tank with some proteomonas green water and then that does the job so we tested this using uh, blue sumo crabs as our model species. Um, mm. uh, the reason we used blue sumo crabs is we wanted to uh, diversify the scope of the thesis. So we'd done a lot of stuff on fish. Uh, why don't we use crabs? Uh, also, when I was running this experiment, I didn't have any fish to play with. So if crabs are all you got, you got to use crabs. Uh, but they still need green water when you're rearing. And the protocols for rearing crab larvae and fish larvae are pretty similar. Um, so I tested uh, three algae, so Proteomonas sulcata, Nanochloropsis, which is kind of like the standard, and Tysocrisis lutea, which is one of those haptophytes I was talking about earlier, um, as the green water against the control of clear water, which is just no microalgae, it's clear water. And we also uh, enriched the live feeds with the, uh, uh, Selco Espresso, that commercial emulsion, to see whether that was even necessary. And as you can see from this first graph, uh, which is 10 day uh, survival, uh, the big takeaway from that is you need some sort of green water uh, and proteomonas and nanocropsis were pretty much the best. Um, and surprisingly, there was absolutely no difference between the enriched and unenriched live feeds. So enriching your live feeds didn't really do anything for survival. It was green water that was driving the results. Uh, we also measured the crabs um that's what well, here's just some pictures of crabs i figured i'd throw them in so, that, so you guys have something to look at um and we measured the crab carapace lengths as well so we could uh get uh some growth data from them as well uh before we get to that though i'll talk about the development um so zoea the crab zoea developed faster in green water compared to the clear water it's pretty pretty obvious um, there was no effect of live feed enrichment towards the later stages, similar to the survival. Um, there's a theory that having too much DHA, um, that fatty acid I was talking about earlier, and um, polyunsaturated fatty acids in crab diets can cause malting failure. Um, we actually didn't see that. So despite crabs that got uh, the enriched diets, which did make their DHA go way up, didn't really seem to have any effect whatsoever. Um, we actually didn't see any malting failure uh, in our experiment at all, which suggests that maybe the Australian blue swimmers crab species, Portunus armatus, may have a uh, higher tolerance to you know, higher levels of these polyunsaturated fatty acids than the Asian species, which is where a lot of the, that research came out of. I think it's Portunus triberculatus. Um, moving on to the growth here we go so um big result here was that the megalopa which is that little crabby looking thing so the stage before they actually turned into a crab were much larger when reared in proteomose green water uh, and again this is probably tied to the 
nutritional benefits of using proteomonas. It's high in those structural lipids. And so the live feeds that are in the green water and eating all of that proteomonas are going to pass on those structural lipids onto the crabs. And this may have implications for restocking projects. Um, in Australia, bluesome crabs are uh, stocked uh, into restock wild populations. And I think it's done, I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty big in Asia as well. Um, but for crabs, you want to release them early because once they turn into little crabs, they like to eat each other. So having uh, crab, either crablets or megalopa that are larger will give them a, a better chance to survive in the wild because they'll have um, a wider diet breadth. If they're bigger, they can eat more things and they might be uh, more robust against predation from you know, other crustaceans that are similar to their size. You know, if you release them into the seagrass beds, there are lots of other little critters and uh, you want to make sure that you give your, fit, your animals the best chance of survival you can whenever you're doing restocking. Okay. So future directions from these two chapters. So basically we've showed that Proteomonas uh, sulcata is an awesome microalgae. I talk to all my colleagues about it. I go, use Proteomonas. It's awesome. Everything it touches turns to gold. Uh, and I guess what you want to take away from that is, uh, you know, test proteomonas and other cryptomonads on more aquaculture species. So, um, you know, other fish, crabs, other invertebrates, sea, um, sea cucumbers, oysters, you name it. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, we only tested two different species, you know, one species of fish and one species of crab in this thesis, because that's all, you know, you've, that's all I had uh, access to. Um, so the more species that we tested on, the better. Um, Another key development, I think, is to develop proteomonas into a paste. So you can see the bottles underneath. Oh, I should say this uh, picture here. This is just a picture I got of proteomonas. So you guys can have a, an idea of what it actually looks like. Um, but you want to turn it. Uh, it'd be great to turn proteomonas into a paste, which is basically just a very concentrated uh, solution or concentrated sludge of um, algal cells. They're all dead. Uh, this is, you know, very common for common aquaculture species like aquaculture microalgae species like nanocoropsis, ice crisis, pavlova, things like that. Um, there's research showing that it can be done with cryptomonads, uh, but it's just a matter of um, getting the getting the word out there that these cryptomonad microalgae are really, really good in aquaculture so that the um, microalgae paste producers go, oh, maybe we should start trialing that and actually turning it into a product that people can buy and try out. And also I mentioned that Proteomonas sulcata is an Australian species. So one of the, um, another takeaway is that, you know, look for other microalgae in your local areas, wherever you may be in the world that may be better than the common, you know, hatchery standards. The reason we chose, uh, well, the reason we had Proteomonas in the first place is because my PhD supervisor uh, for one of his classes just wanted a red microalgae because he thought it looked nice. That's it. <laughs> he had, you know, green microalgae and brown microalgae and he just wanted something red. Um, and then he decided to try it on some animals to see how they grew and wow, they grew really well. So, you know, Trying stuff out, you know, finding new species, giving them a go. Um, you know, you can, you might be able to make some uh, some serious gains and and make some breakthroughs with some aquaculture species that way. If you just, you know, give give a uh, give uh, new things a shot. <laughs> Main takeaway. So, um, I guess another when you're looking at the bigger picture uh, and why I'm so hopeful that there is so much more potential in. Uh, in what, I'm, what I was doing in um, the future of aquaculture is that uh, marine species have been domesticated very recently compared to other organisms. Um, and what we have, the knowledge we have of marine species is so new. Uh, most of the marine species that have been domesticated, it's only happened in the past hundred years, whereas land animals have had thousands and thousands of years. And people are still, there's still a lot of research into improving the, um, you know, agriculture of, of, you know, terrestrial animals. Um, we're domesticating marine organisms at an unprecedented rate and it probably only going to get faster. Uh, and this will definitely impact how we, what, how we perceive what can be grown. So, you know, whether 
you know, some species that pe pe people before went like, oh no, I can't grow that like the tangs. Maybe there's some new technology out there, a new animal or new technique that hasn't been discovered yet that might not be in a standard hatchery practice that people try out and boom, then you can start growing that fish. And um, yeah, by focusing on these uh, specific species or techniques, you might be able to deliver um, surprising advancements as uh, I found out during my PhD. Cool. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Alex. It's a uh, really wonderful. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. I'm just trying to figure out. I'm just trying to go back to the chat. There we go, chat. Yeah, that's no question said, but they will come. Uh, okay. But I'm just saying thank you for your wonderful talk. Yeah, no uh, uh, really interesting. Um, pretty sure there'll be more uh, people from aquaculture who the. I, I think there are. You know, it's, it's a nice overview. And there are many open-ended questions from there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you see, you know, you just started on that topic, and then there's uh, there's still more to do on on that one. Mm. So yeah, yeah, heaps uh, more. yeah. Uh, just wondering what did, what happened to the unfit fish? Did you starve them to death? Yeah, they all died. <laughs> <You don't laughs> right. We need we needed an unfit control um, because I, just at the beginning, like for those tangs, we just you know especially because they're such a difficult fish to grow. They're so fiddly. Uh, we wanted to make sure that if they were dying, it wasn't just because that we were killing them some other way, you know, if yeah. everything was dying after. Um, so we needed to have some sort of unfed, we need to have some unfed control in those experiments to make sure that um, any effects we were seeing were because of the diets. Yeah. Uh, Deepak, uh, there was one question from Mega Malpani. I think I saw her raise the hand. So Mega, if you want to uh, unmute yourself and then speak uh, or ask the question at this point, um, that would be great. Otherwise, I can read it from the chat. Good evening, sir. Hi. Sir, my voice is audible or not? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. You. What's your question? So the question is, uh, the Artemia and the Rodifers that were given, that were fed to blue tanks, it, the mortality will be there or not? Will yeah, so we, we never fed Artemia to them. They never got to that stage. So when we fed Rodifers to the uh, tanks, I'll see if I can go back, actually. Um, yeah, go all the way back. Here we go. So when we fed uh, Rodifers to them at the beginning, there was total mortality. So they didn't eat anything and, and yeah, survival was, you know, at five days was less than 2%. And I think the next day they were pretty much all dead. Um, and that's just because they couldn't eat anything. Once we fed them the uh, acidified oyster trochophores with compromised shells, um, they were, a, we were able to get some to, 10 days old, which at which point they were large enough that they could eat a rotifer. So the oysters were uh, just a not a complete feed for the entire larval duration. They were just there to act as a bridge between the beginning of first feed to when you can transition to those um, more traditional feeds such as rotifers because I'm not discrediting rotifers. They're, they're the basis of so many species um, uh, around the world. Uh, but for some species, they might not be the best option at the very beginning. You need you need something else to get them to that point. Thank you, sir. Hey, Alex. Uh, just uh, one question from the part one of your talk. Um, <laughs> you, yeah, we treated those uh, oyster larvae trochophores with the pH uh, 4.8, right? And yep. um, could see that yeah you're on that right slide you know it's pretty deformed kind of uh, what do you call trophy yeah. for yeah do you, do you have know anything about whether that affect the nutritional qualities? Uh, I did actually look at the um, fatty acid data for the acidified trophies and regular ones and there was no difference between the two so. Um, that was only fatty acids and it was, uh, I think the, uh, analysis we got was kind of like the core marine fatty acids that you look at. It wasn't like this big broad spectrum thing. We didn't look at, uh, lipid classes, but, uh, at least the early, um, like 
early analyses and initial findings found that no, there wasn't a difference. Yeah. So um, for the part two, um, you, you switch from loot tanks to clownfish. Is that just because that was the that's that's the one available to you, or yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of it is um, when you're doing aquaculture research. Uh, I think I had a, a whole bunch of experiments that were planned for like, we were like, oh, we're going to do tangs the whole way through. We're going to follow it all the way through. And then that doesn't work out. I'm like, okay, we'll use the clownfish. And then the clownfish stops spawning. We're like, we need something else. What have we got? We happen to be doing another project with crabs and we're like, we've got crabs and that experiment works with crabs. So let's use crabs. <laughs> Lucky those two are not you know, connected, you know, they were two different things, you know, because sometimes yeah, uh, people ask them to compare, you know, if they are connected no. and you see it. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the, the main focus on this, this is all about the feeds and the live feed enhancements. What you feed them to is, it doesn't matter. You can chop and change as much as you want. Um, yeah. We're not comparing the live, the, ex the uh, experiment with the clownfish and the experiment with the crabs. We're looking at them ind individually. So you go, okay, when you're leaving it, using it as a live feed enhancement for clamfish, it works really great. And when you're using mm. it as a green wood for crabs, it works really great. Usually you can kind of see a pattern. If it works really great for this thing and this thing, there's, you know, there's something there. And um, I think the main takeaway from this thesis was with Proteum Monus at least, there's something there, use it on more species, test it more and um, try to get it in, uh, try to turn it into a, you know, standard, aquaculture microalgae that you'd see in hatcheries all over the place instead of just in one uh one labs freaking room <laughs> that's one uh, question from dr annie Courtney. it's in the chat box because this mic is not working so he so this is the question how the oyster larvae was produced uh is it white collected or from hatchery and how does it compare with production of rotifers ease of culture economic feasibility and other things yeah, so that's one of the big, um, it's, it's a very valid point. So the oysters we were using were wild. So they, um, we just went to a, uh, a local oyster, um, I would call them a farm. They just did wild harvest. They're an oyster shop and they sell oysters to people to eat, but we knew them. We were like, hey, can you just give us some of your big oysters unshucked and we'll spawn them? And um, yeah, we, we just got wild oysters in during, because we were spawning the fish during summer. It was also spawning season for the oysters as well. So we'd get them in, um, uh, kind of time the experiments with when we kind of knew the oysters were going to spawn. So we were talking to them going like, when are they going to spawn? They go, uh, full moon's coming up. They're going to be ready to go. So we'd get the experiment going for that. Um, and then we just spawn them using... Um, temperature manipulation which is pretty standard for oyster hatcheries um and that goes into the so the feasibility side of it um i think it's definitely feasible it does add a layer of um uh complexity i guess uh fortunately oysters are pretty available to most like i think around the world there's usually some sort of oyster that you can use and whether it's rock oysters or pearl oysters the larvae are all kind of the same. So uh, same size at least. Um, so, uh, you know, the techniques and for spawning oysters are there, they exist. Um, like I said, one female oyster can produce millions and millions of larvae and the fertilization rates can be very good if you do it right. Um, you know, if you're using live feeds, you'd need to have the, you know, that would be, you'd need to have some sort of uh, technical level of skill to grow those live feeds. And I would imagine that in that hatchery, that would just be another thing that you do. So you would go, okay, get some oysters in from wherever. You, and it's just part of your hatchery protocol that you'd spawn some oysters. Um, you can refrigerate the oysters as well. So when we deform, um, when we, when you deform them in the acidified water, you can actually throw them in the fridge and they stay basically go into stasis for I think up to a week and they don't change. The nutritional profile doesn't change. The oysters don't change. When you put them back into the water, into warm culture water, they just start back up again. Um, so that's a, a way of overcoming, you know, maybe supply. If you have a, say all your oysters spawn at once, um, or if you only manage to get a few spawns, you can kind of hold those um, 
oysters over and uh, you know tangs and tangs don't spawn very many eggs they i think a typical spawns only like a ten, in the tens of thousands of eggs whereas for larger fish like barramundi it's millions so the the scale especially in these um, developing nations where aqu ornamental aquaculture really that's where it's going to succeed um, the scale is much much smaller you don't need to be producing billions upon billions upon billions of eggs a few oysters getting a few oysters to spawn and having a few million um you know or maybe more than a few million but having millions of uh of larvae should be enough to sustain it and that we were able to sustain it um in our trials where we were you know growing them in some you know not experimental systems but small commercial systems and we were able to sustain them with uh using um you know using oysters and just a few spawns you only need a few good females and you you're pretty much set for 10 days yeah um, it's kind of same question here from manmohan kumar is oyster larvae economically feasible as a feed source of food and i know why these questions are coming up because uh alex we uh, uh, back in india um probably oysters is the only <laughs> only one agriculture species not really you know done commercially uh so okay. even if you want Uh, probably a uh, oyster larvae you know it's kind of the same huddle of uh, standardizing all the hatchery techniques maybe mm. so uh, maybe that's the line of thinking i guess um so yeah is not common um, back there so. yeah and there might be some places that i'm not sure what where oysters are available around the world i know that in the indo pacific it's pretty easy to get to find an oyster and get an oyster hatchery or at least some sort of bivalve hatchery that has small trochophores for because what what you're looking for a uh, trochophores that are about 50 micron and most um bivalve trochophores are about that size uh but my uh, if you if oysters aren't presenting themselves as a economically feasible option then as i was saying at the end of part one, the i think another way to go is to look at what else is out there oysters was the reason we chose oysters is because it was it showed up when i did my literature search and looked at all the invertebrate larvae available to us and what's you know what's the right size what can you produce and blah 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 oysters basically went uh, showed up as you know top contenders so that's why we picked oysters um but if you did plankton trawls and you found some you know random zooplankton that was 50 micron but happens to grow pretty well in aquaculture and the fish eat it and they can survive on it then go with that so I'd say you know take these findings as you know, uh, lessons of thinking outside of the box trying new things if it doesn't work for your specific area then you know go and look for you know try and look for other options that might suit your specific yeah um, these uh, uh, why, why these are not uh, oysters are not very commercial back in it's not the, it's not because they are not found in the wild they are pretty much there it's just uh, not a delicacy domestically uh, oh, okay so uh, 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 yeah yeah so i think it's there's oysters about the one thing they do is the muscle muscle culture there's um it's done commercially just not the oysters so yeah so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, clams uh, clam, uh, whatever <laughs> scallops yeah, <but> <laughs> Uh, Alex, I have uh, one follow-up question on that uh, oyster thing. Uh, so for um, uh, for the places where the oyster is being considered as like one of the delicacies and then oyster itself has its own value. And so mm -hmm. uh, why do we have to uh, to follow or really why do we have to use it as a feed when we, we can... um uh, can grow the oyster and then sell it in the in the market for a premium price i mean in especially in united states oyster is kind of like a like a, a high demand product and high value product here so um when i'm thinking from a, a farmer's perspective here farmers might be thinking hey i have, I have my oyster if i can grow that oyster i can i can sell it to the premium market and get the money rather why should i use it for a feed um as a feed ingredient um or or is that the 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 oyster that you're using is it more like a lower grade um uh lower food grade oysters that you're using it for the feed and that that's my one question yeah. um no sydney rock oysters are very valuable they're probably one of the 
highest, uh, yeah, one of the highest regarded oysters, eating oysters in Australia. Maybe Pacifics are slightly higher. But I would say that the if you were a farmer considering those two and oysters was more profitable, I would say grow oysters. But if you're in an area where, you know, maybe the oyster market is saturated and you can't really find a way in, or if you're an oyster farmer and you want to make some money on the side because you've got all these extra larvae, Mm-hmm. Grow and grow some tangs and make a few bucks in the autumn in the um, ornamental fish trade. Yeah, you know, okay. those might be options. So I don't think it's it's an either or situation. I don't think you if you decide to use them as a feed okay. for fish, you necessarily can't do oysters or you know that's not an option. Um, the the value of um, you know the value of the of the end product for oysters is uh, I, I don't think it's really relevant because you know, you, if you want to grow oysters, you can grow oysters. But um, if you happen to want to grow ornamental fish for whatever reason, because that's what your what's that's what the market demands, or what yeah. that's what the markets that that's available is available to you, then you know this might be an option. And getting, you know, like I said, you don't need many um, many oysters to sustain a a, a small scale ornamental um, fish hatchery. And uh, you know, we were buying oysters. You know, a female oyster, you know, a dollar each. And once you have that oyster, you can also keep it and, you know, condition it and spawn it over in multiple, multiple times. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and I have one more question and then I'm, and I don't bug you. Um, um, I, I'm not a feed person either. So I, you know, I may be telling some su- stupid thing, uh, but um what is the perspective of it since, uh, you know, you're looking at the alternative feed uh, in for aquaculture, uh, what's the, uh, the prospects of insects? I have heard that a lot of studies have been done on spider fly larvae. Um, uh, you know, I, I can name the other one. I can, I, I know that there's another species that they're trying hard in the United States. Uh, what, what's your take on those aspects? Go for it. <laughs> I've never heard of spider. Um, I've never, I haven't looked into insect larvae and whether they're um, compatible with uh, marine larvae, at least for, for a marine. So when you're looking at growing a marine larvae, um, there are basically four, four criteria for your feed. So the first one is it needs to be available to the, to the fish. Um, so that means it needs to stay, stay suspended for fish and crabs. At least it needs to stay suspended in the water column because they're pelagic feeders. They don't feed off the bottom and they don't really feed off the top. Um, so usually you do that with live feeds because they swim pellets and micro diets and things. They're not really great for, for the very first stages of these larvae because they just sink out of and fall out of culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you hammer them with it, it, the cultures get disgusting. So it needs to become available um, it then needs to be the right size. So, so for tangs, that was the big one, size. They need really, really, really small feeds. And that's where a lot of the invertebrate larvae that are around the world and are common, they're too big. So you can't use them. You need to look for something else. Um, so it needs to be the right size so they can actually physically eat it. Um, it then needs to be digestible. So if they can eat it, that's great. They also need to be able to assimilate it. Um, so for oysters, that was the other problem. You know, if they can't digest it, use the acid water, use the acidified water to make that happen. And then once they have that, then the um, nutritional profile needs to be suitable. So for whatever fish you're growing, that's, that's going to be a more species specific thing, or at least like family specific thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it needs to have nu- the correct nutrition that can sustain that fish's growth. Um, whether it's an insect, an oyster, a rotifer, a crustacean, whatever, as long as you tick those criteria off, Mm-hmm. it should work. So, you know, that's why I'm saying go out there, try new things and just work through those criteria and go, okay, okay does it say available? And, oh, and also, can you produce it? I guess that's the very, oh. very, very first thing. Can you actually produce enough of it to, yeah. to feed your, your yeah. larvae? Um, so for oysters, that's a, it's pretty easy because you can produce so many eggs, but for insects, sure, go for it. I'm, yeah. I'm always like, like I'm saying from this, try new things, give it a go. Um, we know so little about marine aquaculture compared to other forms of agriculture. Um, and there's so much knowledge that's yet to be learned that 
trying these new things may, you might hit that eureka moment where you go, oh, wow, that's the, that's an awesome new development. That's going to, you know, change the way we look at growing, you know, marine fish in the world. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I like the criteria you told, Alex. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, question from Mecca Malpani. So is there any mortality when oyster was fed to blue tanks? Uh, yeah, so there was a mortality, like you, you're always, and that I think comes down to the, the tangs themselves that feed aside, blue tangs are extremely fragile larvae. They're, there's, I think that's another big contributing factor to why they haven't been, they're not commercially produced yet, is they're much smaller than um, a normal fish larvae. They're, you know, if your aeration is slightly too strong, they get stuck in the surface tension of the tank. Like they're that weak. And so <laughs> so um, there is always going to be some mortality where we were more interested in looking at, you know, within our treatments, you know, what are the differences between the treatments themselves? And you can see there's this big, you know, you've got your unfed, that's, you know, they're on their way out of five days, there's barely any left. Then you've got your regular trochophores and that's not too hot, you know, it's pretty low and they're also on their way out. But once you make that, you do that next step to make them digestible. That's when you see this big jump up in survival and you also see survival to um, 10 days. So even though it's low, it's a first step. And then you work on refining those techniques to get that survival up and up and up and up. Um, I don't think you're ever going to nail it on the first try, but you know, if you have a place to start, you can keep refining those techniques to improve the survival over and over and over again. Yeah, um, Alex, I have one question from the blue tank uh, section. Uh, you talked about the unenriched diet and you said they die, all of them died or something. And it's- You mean the clownfish, sorry? Uh, the blue For tank. Enrichment? Yeah. If you're um, talking about enrichments, it's- um... Yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, so Lisa, the is uh, the unenriched- mm. Clownfish. Uh, diet, yeah. And it was due to the lack of DHA. Yes. Uh, so that's... I'm wondering at what stage did you find it is because due to the lack of DHA, is it like towards end of your experiment or is what on, yeah. on like, like how did you get there? You know, from that? So uh, that's based on, a, that conclusion was based on a lot of, basically the entire body of aquaculture literature that came before it. So we know that docosahexaenoic acid, DHA, is it's considered the most important fatty acid when it comes to marine fish, and that's because they can't um, synthesize it themselves. They need to get it. It's, a, it's an essential fatty acid. They have to get it from their diet, and it plays a really, really key role in their development, especially their neural development. Um, now these unenriched rotifers and unenriched artemia had None. Like, oh, well, I can show you. Oh, no, I can't. I don't have the fatty acid table. Uh, sorry. I can't show you. I don't have the fatty acid table. I figured a big fatty acid table would make very good viewing. But I can tell you now, they had basically none. Um, and you can see here, so they're up to this point, they're kind of sustaining themselves on their reserves. And then all of a sudden they run out and there's this big trash. There's this big drop off. Um, so the, the lack of DHA was, it, it's a, conclusion that we drew based on the fatty acid data that we had, you know, it was the one thing that stood out really obviously that there was none of that compared to the other treatments. Yeah. yeah and I was also, wondering like, uh, yeah, if you knew it before, why didn't you, you know, culture them uh, with the, you know, tra by a traditional way of giving water. Oh you know? yeah. So yeah, why, yeah, yeah. why do it in the first place? Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah again, yeah. it comes, it comes down to that, un to that we needed a control. So we needed to know that if, um, you know, we needed some sort of baseline to go against. We need some sort of, you know, crappy treatment to, to go, okay, here's, here's bad, you know, unenriched is here's what happens if you do it, if you do it wrong. And the enriched treatment with commercial products is here's what happens if you do it the normal way. And let's see where the um, alternative method fits in. Um, I guess when you're going into experiment, you don't really know that this is going to happen either. We kind of had a suspicion that, 
they weren't going to grow very well on an unenriched diet. But there are some clownfish um, that can go uh, all the way through to metamorphosis without any enrichment, although they do get deformities, um, particularly with their coloration. They get and their survival isn't that great, but they can survive. Um, for this species in particular, they can't survive. They needed it. So um, yeah, with hindsight, it's pretty easy to go, you know, in hindsight, yeah, you probably could get rid of that treatment. Um, but when you're starting an experiment, you want to make sure that you have proper controls and that your um, your experimental design is set up um, properly so that you can answer uh, or you have comparisons for all these different, you know, how, for all these different conclusions, depending on how it ends up. And uh, what about the in the part one, um, you have a... Um, you know, one of them was unfed, right? Unfed. Mm. Uh, yeah. So is that a control in that experiment? Unfed? Yes. Yes. That's the control. So that's to make sure that if, um, so if everything died, yeah, everything yeah, died. I, I'm getting there. So, so I, I was wondering, <laughs> You've got a I was, control. I was going to ask, why did you show graph showing the survival and keeping unfed as a control? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> like, you know, you, there was a graph showing the survival and oh yeah 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 and, and, and keeping unfurred as a control doesn't make sense you know <laughs> well it does, it's it's more like i guess it, again it comes down to you don't know uh how your results are going to play out so hypothetically what it so at five days are unfed uh, there's still some left but there's bugger all and they're all, they're on the way out but what if everything else was lower what if everything else was dead then then the result is this is worse than not feeding them anything. This is actually killing them, you know? So you want to make sure you have something there that's an absolute baseline and so that you have something to compare to compare against. Yeah, I mean, I mean, theoretically, we would assume, you know, they would die anyway if, if you unfed Yeah, them I mean, we know they're going to die anyway, but the time, the time, yeah. It's, yeah. especially the time scale, you know, how long is it going to take for them to die? Yeah. I, don't yeah, know. <laughs> I, I think uh, yeah, I was misled there somewhere because I didn't know the time scale you're looking at. So yeah, mm. yeah, it makes sense now. Um, so uh, is there anyone else want to ask a question? Please unmute yourself and you can ask. Oh, may I have a question? Okay, yeah, thanks, um, Alex, for that presentation. So my question is on, um, uh, maybe before I ask, I just want to like to give a brief on what my question will be referring to. Um, my name is Maureen and I'm doing my, currently doing my PhD at the University of Idaho and I'm working with Dr. Ken Kane. So we are trying to, um, to look for alternative feeds for, for barbot is a freshwater cod, and it was recently identified as um, uh, a potential aquaculture species. And these barbot, we normally feed them live feeds for almost 70 days post hatch. So at hatch, normally they are very small, like between um, three to four millimeter in, in length. And at that point in time, they don't even have um, their mouth yet. So we mm -hmm. normally start feeding them um, uh, green water. We use nanochloropsis and that is from eight days post hatch to 10 days post hatch. And then from that period uh, at 11 days, we introduce rot fuzz. So I'm trying to see, we are looking for alternatives. So I've done at least one project where we've used um, easy atemia that is by, provided by uh, is a uh, Ziegler and it is in liquid form, almost like in a pest form. So, mm. but that is an alternative for um, Atemia. So Atemia, what we use, we use brine shrimp. So we use um, uh, San Francisco Atemia. And then later we transition to Great Salt Lake. So we are trying to see how best can we reduce on this period of providing live feeds to this mm. freshwater cod. So um. Um, that then uh, from there, I'll ask my question. So you used, uh, I'm seeing you used oyster larvae for the blue tanks. Uh, do you think, uh, I know you did this for only a shorter period, only the early periods mm -hmm. of growth. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think if at all you had 
fed for more than five days post hatch, what would happen? And are there only, you, to, you mentioned that um, there are some frozen um, oyster, uh, oyster larvae that someone could use. Are there like any um, different sizes that someone could use or um, is there only one size that is standard for on, the only the larvae? Are there like adults um, that someone could feed? So maybe I could try that out because we are looking at trying out different alternatives, um, mm. uh, available feeds that we can use to try still to reduce on the period of using um, live feeds in barboat growth because it's really expensive. We have to culture, you know, these live feeds for longer periods and mm-hmm. you have to feed them for more, almost uh, 60 70. to 70 days post That's crazy. Yeah, 70 yeah. days is, is a really long time period. What's the temperature of the water when you grow barboat? Um, the temperature normally when they are like, um, normally they prefer between maybe 12 to 14 when they are still in their larval stages. Really so, but me. sometimes we've also used 10 degrees to 12, but yeah. at that period, of course, they won't feed all that much, but the optimum is between, for the love is between 14 to 16. Mm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's really cold <laughs> for us to like um, what I'm doing now. Like, so I'll answer your questions, uh, but I'll just uh, get uh, uh, seven days is a long time for live feeds uh, with the barramundi work that I mainly work on now that, that my role with the Darwin Aquaculture Centre, we wean our fish off live feeds and onto a micro diet at day uh, day 18, just after two weeks. Uh, But that's because we grow them in 30 degree water. So I wonder whether that that extended um, time period of uh, live feeds might be tied to their slow, like the colder water, they're going to grow slower. Um, so to go back to your original question, so why I we did feed these fish longer than five days, but it, mm-hmm. they all died. So it doesn't make for a very interesting graph when you got everything at zero at like eight days or whatever it was. So we chose five days because that was um, when we saw, you know, a really apparent difference between the treatments or at least for this, in this case, no real difference, like a, a slight change, but you know, in the paper, at least we specify that they all die eventually. So the, the feeding the um, cast, the oyster villages or untreated trochophores, you know, it's, it's not going to work out. Um, uh, to go to your other question of um, whether there's uh, an alternative to uh, Artemia, was that what you were asking? Sorry, <laughs> I'm just trying to remember. Yeah, my, my other question was on um, oyster. You know, um, it's only you only use the larvae. Are there like different sizes, uh, or oh, it's yes. only the larvae size? Yeah, so there's um there's different. So the size of oyster larvae is gonna is driven by species. Uh, well, there's some difference. That you'll get slight differences depending on how you provision your um, rootstock. So. If you give them really, really, really good food, they'll probably produce a slightly larger oyster yeah. larvae, yeah. Um, but they're not big differences. We're talking pretty, pretty minute differences in the grand scheme of things. So the the size that we use, they're all pretty much the same, about fifty micron. Uh, oh. Yeah, I think this is a twenty five micron scale bar, um, even though it's not put in there. Sorry, I just copy and pasted that straight from the thesis. Um, uh, so the size is pretty much all the same They're from all the oysters that we use. They're all 50 micron. Um, we could refrigerate them, not freeze them. Um, freeze them would definitely kill them, but you could keep them refrigerated at four degrees Celsius and they'll last for, for a week. And whether they're bigger or smaller, that's just going to depend on the species that you use. So if you're in America, in Idaho, then you're going to be, uh, you're not going to have Sydney rocks, but I think you will have Pacific oysters um, and I, from memory there, the size of their larvae are pretty much the same as well, about 50 micron. Um, I, I find it the easy Artemia. So the easy Artemia that you use, is that a, they, are they dead or are they live Artemia that just, they are like dead. A, actually it mm. is synthetic, actually synthetic Artemia. Mm. So it's not alive. So they are not, they are not alive. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you're able to transition them from an actual live feed 
that moves and triggers that feeding response onto this like easy artemia, then you know it maybe look into the weaning your weaning process, um, and you might be able to find a micro diet that works. Like we use um, a brand called Otahime for our barramundi larvae, and it's great. It's really, really, really high quality larval micro diet. Um, it doesn't clump up like some other okay. brands. Um, it uh, it stays it, when you put it in the water. It, it it makes a fine dust over the top of the tank and then slowly falls down the water column. So it gives the fish um, a lot of uh, time and opportunity to eat it. Um, I've seen I've used some products where you throw it in, it just comes in as like a clump and then just falls down as a clump, and you're like, uh-huh. what's, what's even the point? Um, so if you're using these easy artemia that, I mean, I would consider that you, you've already started the process of transitioning to a formulated diet. It's uh-huh. just that it's not like a, a micro diet. So um, if you're looking at a way to shorten the time of uh, shorten the time that you're using live feeds, just work on the, on that weaning period, uh, you know, co-feeding, you know, obviously you don't go hard, like, you feed rotifers from here to here, and then you stop rotifers and start artemia from here to here, and then you stop artemia and you move on to the easy artemia. There's going to be crossover. And uh-huh. if you look at the some of the research that oh, I can't remember the name of the name of the guys. Um, I think a guy, there's a guy called oh, I can't remember his name. Um, but there are people that did a lot of work with Seabrim and trying to get uh, formulated diets in earlier and um, (laughs) using weaning strategies to uh, try to, you know, minimize that live feed time. I don't don't think they ever got them onto artificial diets straight from the get-go, but I think they got pretty close. Um, That is a different species though. Sea brim are obviously not. um, uh, Yeah. I think I I read, I read that paper. Uh, They were Mm. able, it was co-feeding. So they were, they were successful by um, co-feeding, feeding life feeds with, a micro diety mm, and yeah 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 so that's that's the way it's always going to work like you it's uh-huh. pretty you gotta remember these are larvae right they're they're not smart they don't really have the capacity to process information very well so you've got to make sure you're you're co-feeding um you're co-feeding effectively. So you're using Uh a product that stays in the water column and is available to the larvae so that they can actually recognize it as food. Uh, And then it's just a matter of bringing that earlier, like a day earlier, every run, just a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier. Um, People, there's been studies that done uh, on that kind of stuff with barramundi as well. Uh Um, Yeah, but lots of, like, it's a pretty um, common uh, desire in finfish aquaculture at least you want to live feeds are you know pretty expensive to produce and they also carry some risk so and some and usually that's unavoidable you have to have live feeds so you have to accept that risk but if you can minimize that time and bring artificial diets up earlier you're going to want to do that so um yeah look at other brands like otahime is it's a Japanese it's, um, mm-hmm. from Japan, yeah. so give that this a go. Summer, I'm going to be using Otohimi. So previously, oh, nice. we've been using uh, Gemma Diety, uh, the yeah. micro Gemma Diety. We've tried using it, but this time around in this summer, we are going to be using Otohimi. So we, we used to use Gemma. So that uh, the Barramundi protocols that we use at DAC, they were based on Gemma, and then we transitioned. Uh, this is before my time but they moved on to Otohime. I'm not sure if that was based on availability or whether they found Otohime was a superior product though. I think it was not available. I even remember my, the, it has ever been used in my lab, but my major professor told me it was, it became scarce. So they had to resort to Gemma Diety. That might just be availability then. Yeah. We don't have any problem getting it here in Australia. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether that speaks to their um, global distribution at least. <laughs> Yeah, we will try to use um, Otohime this summer and see um, and try to compare it to the Gemma diety. So I'll have at least one treatment, but we are going to be using copy pods, um, the frozen ones. So we want to see whether they, they are, there is also a potential of using copy pods in, yeah. for this fresh water, cold water species. Mm. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd say if you ever use, uh, this is just a 
personal opinion. Um, I would say if you're transitioning into a frozen dead, like, a, sorry, like a dead diet of like, it's an actual animal, but it's dead. Okay. Um, I would suspect that if they're receptive to that, there's a good chance that they'll also be receptive to a micro diet because in my experience, it's the movement. Uh, the reason that micro diets fail is because they lack the movement. They don't move. And so they don't trigger that feeding response that fish have. Whereas okay. if, but once they get to the point where they no longer need the movement, they just need something in front of them. Um, I would suspect that they won't really care whether it's a copepod or a nartemia or just a little bit of pellet. They'll, they'll probably be in the, in that mood that they'll be like, it's in front of me, it's food. I've got to eat it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's just that my is- opinion though. That's not based on any papers that I've read. <laughs> hypothesis. <laughs> it's a hypothesis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I will leave that discussion there. Um, there's a link provided in the chat box. Uh, if all of you can, please uh, go and provide us the feedback. And I will pass that to Alex if he is interested. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, if any, anyone else have a question, uh, this is the last chance to ask. Or else I'm going to ask the last question. So can drop silence. Okay. Yep. So on you do uh, back. <laughs> my my last question. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I know what you uh, you you mentioned. Why did, uh, why did you stuck with proteomonas? Oh, well, sorry, proteomonas. <laughs> proteomonas. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because your supervisor was um, interested in that. But did you uh, ever explore any other option when you started your experiments? Yeah. No, so we the we wanted to try out proteomonas because we knew like I think there are three papers that test proteomonas as a diet. One of them is as a diet for copepods by Richard Nucky, and he doesn't even call it proteomonas; he just calls it the um, the strain number from CSIRO um, that he bought it as. <laughs> Uh, the other paper is from one of my co-supervisors who tries it on sea urchin larvae. And that's not even a direct like paper paper on proteomonas. It just, it mentions that they use proteomonas to grow their urchins. Um, maybe it was two. I can't remember. I can't remember if it was the third one, but the point was there was very, very, very little information on the use of proteomonas. So, and we had it, it was available to us and we, we, no one had ever tested it on anything. So we went, okay, let's try this one. Um, whether there are other algae, I'm sure there are. There actually, we did do some experiments using a calcifying algae on sea urchin larvae to see how that went. So that we had already kind of followed that thread of trying new um, new microalgae for aquaculture. By you know, my lab or well, my old lab did a lot of sea urchin aquaculture, and they were already following that thread of like, oh, we've got this calcifying. Um, microalgae and our sea urchins calcify if we give them a diet of calcified algae i wonder if that helps them with calcification yeah and they tried that out so um for me no proteomonas was enough one species is enough for one phd i don't (laughs) but um yeah i would i would be i would say there are definitely other algae out there that would have you know would, would be really beneficial or at least worth looking into like proteomonas. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so, so people are asking your email ID if they want to contact you. So, if you are happy, could you type in, in the chat box for everyone? Sure, I'll give my work ID. Yeah, yeah <laughs> chat box. And, and um, yeah, there are a few people who actually give thank you for your presentation and uh, it was an excellent and informative session. Worries. So I just press enter. There we go. And so that's my work email. Yeah. And someone asked whether Proteum owners available in India, if you know. Don't know. Which, uh, I would say probably not because it is an Australian microalgae. Mm. Um, you could probably get it there if you go through quarantine. 
Uh, but having said that, there are lots of other cryptomonad microalgae in the world. So there's Rhodomonas, which is available in Europe, and you know there there are other algae like Proteomonas that are almost the same thing. So even if Proteomonas isn't available to you, try to see what is available to you. Whether other cryptomonads, I'm sure there are some, and try those out. You might get similar results, or you might not, and that's also interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we're going to wrap up here. Uh, someone asked, uh, he missed your presentation. Is it going to be available? Yes, uh, but only after two weeks, uh, just double policy. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and you can follow, uh, the link is provided in the chat box. Uh, please subscribe to that. And after two weeks, this talk is going to be available. And also all the previous talks are available. Um, if the speakers have given their consent and Alex have already given his consent. So this is going to be available. Um, so that's it from here. And uh, thanks everyone for joining in and uh, we'll see you in two weeks time. Uh, again, on Saturdays, same time, uh, log in, see you again. Thanks Alex very much. Awesome. No worries. Thank you very much everyone. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. See ya.